How could there possibly be 44,000 year old wood inside 45 million year old rock? One thing's for certain, at least one of those dating methods wasn't working. And of course, biblical creationists would say both. The dating game, it has some real problems these days. No, gentlemen, I'm not talking about the fact that apparently most women swipe left 90% of the time. Or that ladies, many men have chosen to get passports and run off to foreign countries to find traditional women instead of dealing with Western feminism. No, I'm talking about those dating methods that you often hear referenced in support of the story of evolution that have supposedly disproven the biblical timeline. Now, biblical creationists have long pointed out the many problems with the unprovable assumptions behind these techniques, like carbon-14 and other radioisotope dating methods, which were actually developed long after the idea of millions of years had been accepted as fact by evolutionists, primarily because of the rock layers seen around the world. And of course, we've dealt with the many problems concerning their interpretation of those rock layers before. However, despite what the average person thinks about these methods because of the way they're often presented, expert geologists and archaeologists that believe in long ages and understand the limitations of those methods don't count on them exclusively as a way of supposedly determining the age of something. And how can you know that? Well, here are a couple of quotations, one from a book on Egyptian archaeology, another from an associate professor of geology, and then a quote from a general book on geology, respectively, that should help put this in perspective. If a C14 date supports our theories, we put it in the main text. If it does not entirely contradict them, we put it in a footnote. And if it's completely out of date, we just drop it. In general, dates in the correct ballpark are assumed to be correct and are published, but those in disagreement with other data are seldom published nor are the discrepancies fully explained. If the laboratory results contradict the field evidence, the geologist assumes that there's something wrong with the machine date. To put it another way, good dates are those that agree with the field data, fossils in the strata. Now, when you think about it, it's extremely obvious from just these three examples that in many cases, radiometric dating isn't the primary method being used to determine the age of whatever sample is being tested. For example, in the first case, we see the statement, if a C14 date supports our theories, and then the quotation proceeds to describe whether the date was correct, compatible, or corrupt. And from there, they either put it in the main text, footnote it, or drop it completely. Which means they must have already determined how old they think it is, and the radiometric date won't dissuade them. Otherwise, they wouldn't have known whether the date was good, bad, or ugly, so to speak, to begin with, as they wouldn't have had anything to compare the calculated dates to. This type of choose-your-own-adventure reporting isn't science in its truest form. It's actually just cherry-picking your data. Now, despite the average person often assuming these dating methods are absolute, most people have no clue how they actually work. And many assume that these methods somehow measure time itself. But this isn't so. These types of dating methods are based on measuring certain elements that decay over time, not time itself. And to explain the principles upon which all radiometric dating methods work, before we get into more detail, I'm going to use an analogy of a burning candle to help us understand this better. Let's say we light a 10-inch candle to record how long it takes to burn down, its decay rate. And let's say that the candle burns away at one inch per hour. After three hours, the candle is only seven inches tall, etc. Now, if we then walk into a room that we've never been in before and see a lit candle that's five inches high, we might logically conclude, based on our previous research, that the candle had been burning for five hours. After all, we measured the decay rate of the candle at one inch per hour and the candle was 10 inches tall to start, so it's a simple case of arithmetic. How could anyone not see how easy it is to tell how much time has passed based on the carefully measured data we'd collected earlier? But if we weren't there to see the candle lit, this conclusion, of course, would be assuming several unprovable things. For example, we don't know that the candle wasn't lit, snuffed out, and then relit sometimes later, maybe just a few minutes before we walked in. 
We don't know that the environment was the same as the one we made our calculation in either. For example, maybe the window was open in this room and the wind caused the candle to burn at a faster rate than the environment we measured in where the windows were sealed. We don't even know that this candle wasn't 20 inches tall when it started. Our five hour guess, although logically concluded, would have assumed to know three specific things. One, the starting amount of the substance, 10 inches tall. Two, the original conditions, no open windows, etc. And three, that the decay rate was constant, one inch per hour throughout the entire life of the candle. And although analogous, this method of assuming the age of something by knowing the current decay rate of a certain element and measuring the amount of that element within a given sample is how all these radiometric dating methods work. Now, one can simply assert that we shouldn't question the assumptions behind these dating methods and take them at face value. However, there's good reason not to trust them blindly, namely because they can often give impossible results. And how can this be? Well, let me explain a little bit more about C14 dating. Firstly, I've found that many people are surprised to learn that carbon dating does not generally work directly on sedimentary, that's fossil bearing, rocks. Carbon dating only works on things that were once alive, while the other radiometric dating methods can generally only be used on igneous, once molten rocks. More on those later. When creatures are alive, they absorb C14. However, once an organism dies, radiocarbon slowly decays to nitrogen-14 without being replenished. So the ratio of carbon-14 atoms to regular carbon atoms will decrease over time. Now, if you know the decay rate and the amount of carbon-14 and the number of nitrogen-14 atoms in a sample, you can then attempt to determine its age. The rate of this decay is what geologists attempt to determine and use to date samples containing C14 using the assumptions mentioned previously. And any organic material thought of as older than 100,000 years should contain no significant amount of C14 because the carbon should have decayed away by then. But this has been shown false according to the evolutionary timeline on several occasions, as C14 has been detected in samples thought to have been millions of years old, hence the impossible results I mentioned earlier. For example, dates of around 20,000 years have been given to wood samples from the Marlstone rock bed in southern England, but they're found in layers thought to be 189 million years old. And diamonds, thought to be 1 to 3 billion years old by evolutionists, have given C14 results 10 times over the detection limit, where there should be none if that vast time span were to be true. As a matter of fact, just between 1984 and 1998 alone, scientific literature reported C14 in 70 samples that come from fossils, coal, oil, natural gas, and marble, representing the fossil-bearing portion of the geologic record supposedly spanning more than 500 million years. Now, evolutionists can try to explain this away as due to contamination, for example, but due to the numerous examples known, that would only lend support to the fact that we should be very suspicious of any dates given by C14 dating. One has to ask, if contamination is possible in so many instances, should C14 dating be trusted for anything? And one question I love to pose to my evolution-believing friends is this. How accurate do you think C14 dating would be if there had been a worldwide flood approximately 4,400 years ago? And after them howling that there never was a global flood and me asking, but what if there had been? They typically concede that it would have messed up the whole method. Why? Well, the reason is radiocarbon dating assumes that the current carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio, after adjusting for the Industrial Revolution, of about one in a trillion is the starting ratio for the objects being dated. But this ratio would have been much smaller before the flood, which removed almost all living carbon from the biosphere through burial of the existing biomass. And because pre and para-flood objects would have started with a much lower initial carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio, the measured amount today would also be smaller and could be misinterpreted as much older. Now, each dating method, as there are many, like rubidium to strontium, uranium to lead, etc., 
has a different rate of radioactive decay, depending on what element is being measured. So what about these dating methods that we hear that supposedly give us dates ranging into the billions of years? Well, as stated, carbon-14 can only date up to a supposed 100,000 years. Uranium lead dating, however, is a method that could theoretically give dates up to 4.5 billion years because of how slowly we've observed uranium's decay rates. However, all these other methods also assume the same thing, consistent decay rates, but that's a big assumption. For example, as early as 2006, New Scientist magazine carried an article called Half-Life Heresy. And in it, Professor Klaus Rolfs of Ruhr University explained why what he had discovered was considered heresy, you know, against the common view, among scientists using these dating methods. When I was studying physics, my teacher said nuclear properties are independent of the environment. You can put nuclei in the oven or the freezer or any chemical environment and the nuclear properties will stay the same. That's not true anymore. His experiments demonstrated nuclear decay rates are not always constant and can change under differing circumstances. That was obviously a real shock to those that had always been taught they were absolutely constant. However, prior to this, creationists had already pointed out several examples of problems with these dating methods as well. Take the lava dome formed after the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. The brand new rock that formed at its peak after the final eruption provided a perfect testing ground for various radiometric dating methods. And imagine the surprise when the rocks dated from 340,000 to 2.8 million years old, when its actual age was less than 25 years. No results came out younger than this. And please understand, because I've heard this objection from skeptics so many times, there is no retained age that could be calculated in these rocks, which is admitted by evolutionary geologists. That's just not how the method works. This situation isn't like a blind date where you don't know exactly what you're getting into beforehand. So a good question to ask is, if you can't trust these methods on rocks that you do know the age of, why would you trust it on rocks that you don't know the age of? Another example that combined both carbon and radioisotope dating was from an area in Australia. In 1994, some people were drilling through sand and clay when they struck a basalt layer that had apparently flowed over a forest at one point because it had some charred wood encapsulated inside of it. Now this was a good time to check out both methods, carbon dating and other radioisotope dating, versus each other, as both samples must have obviously been from the same time period. The results, however, said that the wood was 44 to 45,000 years old, while the basalt surrounding it was 45 million years old. How could there possibly be 44,000 year old wood inside 45 million year old rock? One thing's for certain, at least one of those dating methods wasn't working. And of course, biblical creationists would say both. In short, there are hundreds of Earth's processes that set limits on the age of the Earth, and most of them give an age far less than the billions of years required for the story of evolution. Many dating methods have proven unreliable in far too many circumstances to be thought of as foolproof, even by evolutionists. And to illustrate the fallibility of the idea that we can be absolutely sure of something's age based on man-made dating methods, based on faulty presuppositions, let me share a quote with you from cave specialist Jerry Trout. He perfectly illustrates the interpretive nature of these dating methods when describing the history of Carlsbad Caverns, New Mexico in the United States, a cave system full of stalactites and stalagmites which were at one time interpreted by evolutionists as having formed over many thousands of years. From 1924 to 1988, there was a visitor's sign above the entrance to Carlsbad Caverns that said Carlsbad was at least 260 million years old. In 1988, the sign was changed to read 7 to 10 million years old. Then for a little while, the sign read that it was 2 million years old. Now the sign is gone. So. Scientists gathered new data over time and updated their estimations, and updates are fine. That's how science works. 
But for the average layperson who's putting their trust in these dates as factual, which of those dates was true? Which was fact and which was scientific in the way the average person thinks? Was it 260, 7 to 10 or 2 million years old? Or were they all just simply the fallible guesses of man, attempting to determine things beyond the revelation of God's word? You know, over the years, I've had many people say something to the effect of that, well, the Bible isn't a scientific textbook. And thank goodness for that, because then it would be overpriced and change every 10 years. No, the Bible isn't a science textbook, and it's not even a religious book. The Bible is the truth, the revelation of the only one with all knowledge who was there from the beginning. And we can trust it from the very first verse. Modern dating methods have very little credibility and should not be thought of as authoritative in any absolute sense. Certainly not enough to make someone attempt to change or disbelieve the plain reading of the Word of God. Thy word is true from the beginning. Psalm 119 verse 160.